The Barnett family was unlucky for a long time. They had no children. Mrs. Sandra Barnett was medicated and traveled to every church and holy place possible, hoping her prayers would be answered. Her husband, Mr. Christopher Barnett, followed his wife everywhere like a faithful knight, but no result. The Barnetts came to terms with their situation and decided to take a child from an orphanage, or better yet, two girls. They packed a travel bag to meet the little kids in a neighboring state where the orphanage was located. There were babies as young as three years old being held there. Sandra was packing sandwiches with homemade cutlets when suddenly their appetizing smell became unpleasant to her. The woman rushed to the bathroom, clamping her hands over her mouth. She felt nauseous. The trip had to be canceled. Instead, the couple went to the clinic, where they found out that Sandra was 16 weeks pregnant. Christopher was almost out of his mind with happiness. The gynecologist and waiting patients threatened to call security if the man did not calm down. From that day on, the couple switched to waiting mode. The man bought cottage cheese, fruits, and vegetables from the farmer's market, all without nitrates and pesticides. Sandra kept her diet and regimen disciplined. A few weeks later, fate gave the Barnetts another surprise. An ultrasound scan revealed twins. The pregnancy was hard for Sandra. She was not young. She had to stay in the hospital most of the time during the pregnancy, but the woman's suffering was not in vain. In due time, two beautiful twin girls were born, and the Barnett family began a life full of cares and troubles, but at the same time, an amazing and happy life. Their daughters were named after their grandmothers, Bonnie and Maud. The girls grew up quiet and healthy, pleasing their parents and not causing them serious problems. Mom and Dad were proud to note that their twins were far ahead of their peers in development. They were clever and obedient, similar to two peas in a pod. At the same time, though, they were different in character. Bonnie was engaged in sports and was a very sociable child. And Maud adored reading books in nature and loved solitude. Both sisters loved each other, though. It was apparent how strong the spiritual bond between them was. Eighteen years passed like it was nothing. The girls grew up and became real beauties. Bonnie was wooed by young guys. There was no shortage of admirers. She twisted them around her fingers as she wished. The girl led a busy life. She was a professional swimmer and often went to competitions. She had been to many states because of her success in the sport. And at one of the competitions, Bonnie met Michael. He was a cheerful and fun-loving guy. The two liked each other and they began to communicate daily. Then they started spending more time together and dating. And soon the couple, without thinking about it for a long time, decided to get married. They told their parents about it. On the other hand, Maud led an almost private life. She made no friends. Communicating with her parents and sister was enough. She rarely left the town. She did not like to travel. Maud's favorite hobby was cooking. From simple products, the girl created masterpieces of taste, and often the housemates grumbled in jest. When your sister cooks like a professional chef, how can you watch your figure? Grumbled Bonnie. Maud also loved animals and was always bringing them home. A kitten with a broken leg, a starling with a broken wing, even a mangled beast. She was always rescuing, treating, and nursing. As a permanent resident, they had a huge shepherd dog, Grom, Maud's favorite. The father gave the puppy to his daughter for her birthday three years ago. The fluffy little lump on thick legs won the girl's heart immediately and for all time. Since then, the puppy had grown into a huge dog and became Maud's best friend and protector. Although shepherds are large and formidable dogs, Grom did not live up to his intended purpose at all. He would lunge at everyone for the sole purpose of licking them to death. When Grom tried to reach her face with his tongue, Bonnie squeaked. Oh, Grom, stop it. What kind of dog are you? Get your paws off. Maud, call your drooler. I've got hair all over my sweater. The shepherd wasn't offended. He just as eagerly switched to Michael, the groom. He laughed, waving the annoying dog off. All right, all right, no time for you, you silly. 
Grom, weighing 60 kilograms, ran to his mistress, cheerfully wagging his tail. He loved playing, but there was no time for games today. Bonnie and Michael were getting ready for the marriage ceremony, so many nuances had to be discussed with their parents. The groom's mom and dad were also expecting a video call. An online conference call was scheduled. After all, a wedding is a significant event in a family's life, and that wedding day was just around the corner. Michael was literally carrying his bride in his arms. He gave her flowers and bought her funny trinkets. Her parents and sister were worried, though, because after the wedding, the groom had to take their beloved to another city, to a new apartment bought as a gift by her parents-in-law. The young couple gathered at a restaurant the day before to discuss the wedding details, such as the decorations of the hall and the menu. Naturally, they called Maud, who knew a lot about cooking. It was impossible to do it without Maud in such a sensitive matter as a festive table. So the three got in the car, and Michael started the engine. Then, something unbelievable happened to Grom. He started throwing himself under the wheels of the car, chewing on the tires, barking and howling. Christopher, the father, jumped out of the house to put a collar on the distraught dog and take him home. Bonnie said to her sister, you've spoiled your pet, he won't let you go anywhere alone. Maud remained silent, worried that something was wrong. But to cancel an important trip because of Grom's whims, she didn't dare. She didn't want to hurt her little sister. So the girl looked at the dog through the back window and waved cheerfully, and the car drove away. Grom gave a long howl, and it seemed like a tear even rolled down his face. Christopher got goosebumps down his back. He had never seen a dog cry before. Michael drove skillfully and confidently. His bride was not afraid, even when the speedometer showed an increase in speed of over 100 kilometers an hour. The sisters and Michael chatted and joked as if nothing was off. Then the driver, Michael, slowed down a little. There was a dangerous turn ahead. The road was dry. The car dashed into a sharp curve of the road. But just then, a lumber truck flew into the oncoming lane. The trailer with a heavy load wobbled from side to side. The driver tried to straighten his truck, but he had no time. The timber tractor crushed the silver sedan. After a while, rescuers, police, and an ambulance arrived at the scene. Two bodies were lying on the side of the road, all bagged up. Michael and Bonnie were dead. Rescuers had to cut through metal to get the beautiful young couple out of the mangled car. The ambulance siren, wailing, was rushing into town. The doctors in the cabin were working to save Maud, who miraculously survived, but never regained consciousness. The driver of the lumber truck an elderly man who had not received a single scratch was sitting beside the road, gripping his hands on his head and rocking from side to side. What have I done, old fool? I have killed! I have killed! He had been exhausted lately, working long stretches without a day off. He had fallen asleep while driving and had caused an absolute tragedy. Instead of a wedding, it was now a funeral. The parents aged 10 years in the span of a week. They stood by their graves like stone statues, silent. There was no strength to even cry. But when the first lump of earth fell on Bonnie's coffin, the mother could no longer hold back. She almost threw herself into the grave. Michael's father was shaking with small tremors. He was alone at the funeral. The boy's mother had had a stroke. Sandra and Christopher were left with one daughter, but that didn't add to the joy. Maud was in a deep coma, unresponsive to anything. Instead of a beautiful and intelligent girl, she was plugged into life support in the ICU. It was painful to look at her parents. Everyone they knew, relatives and friends, were afraid to talk to them, as if their grief was contagious and could spill over to others. The medics did their best, but the hope of Maud's return from the other side was fading before their very eyes, and only one of them, a young doctor named Jacob, stood up for his patient's life with enviable tenacity. Yes, he was a real doctor, determined, talented, honest. He clung to every opportunity that gave the girl a chance. Colleagues shook their heads, not understanding why Jacob was fighting so desperately. He hadn't 
really fallen in love with a sleeping beauty, had he? And no one knew or would have believed that Jacob had indeed fallen in love with Maud when he first saw her. Fragile, delicate, like an outlandish butterfly with broken wings. Eventually, Jacob made up his mind and convened a concilium. The eminent doctors argued fiercely and insisted that the young doctor was committing murder. This was unacceptable. Others argued that it was a chance. Colleagues did not notice the elderly woman who quietly entered the room. Everyone was silent. Mrs. Sandra Barnett stood quietly distraught and looked at the doctors with eyes full of despair. Jacob approached the woman. Mrs. Sandra Barnett, listen to me. Please don't interrupt. He explained to the mother that the concilium had accepted his proposal to introduce a new medicine that had proven itself in research. Urgent surgery was needed. Urgent and very expensive, but Maud needed it. Jacob's faith in a miracle was so strong that the mother did not hesitate, and the father sold the car, valuables, and appliances to gather the necessary amount. Better this than to watch our little girl slowly fade away. Mr. Christopher Barnett could barely hold his tears back. Isn't that right, Grom? He stroked the emaciated dog's head. Grom sighed heavily. He ate nothing. He only drank water from time to time. No one knew how long the dog had left to live. The operation was unsuccessful and yielded no positive results. Jacob irritably pulled the gloves off his hands and left the operating room. He did not want anyone to see this young, strong man in tears. All for nothing. All for nothing. Christopher and Sandra had lost all hope. They had to say goodbye to their daughter. There was no more money left to run the life support machine. They wandered down the hospital corridor supporting each other like two decrepit old people. Christopher left the door unlocked when he left the house. Darling, I'm not likely to come back to this house after Maud, Father swayed. And you too, I know. At least let the dog be able to go outside then. But Jacob did not give up. He decided to sell everything. He had to take out a loan and was even ready to rob a bank so that Maud would not be turned off. All that was left was to wait for the parents and tell them everything. Maud must live. That was it. The arriving parents entered the room. Sandra kissed her daughter goodbye. Christopher stood and wept with grief. Soon Jacob would appear at the door and it would all be over. Another life would come to an end. We should have taken Grom to say goodbye, Christopher said. Just then, a room door burst open and a huge dog flew in. He ran up to the girl's bed and shrieked so shrilly with joy that the parents shuddered simultaneously. He was rushing around the bed, whimpering, licking Maud's face and furiously wagging his tail as if it were a little propeller. Sandra and Christopher didn't move from their seats, stunned by what was happening in front of them. And a miracle happened. The sensors came to life, signaling that the patient had come out of her coma. The girl's eyelashes flooded open and she opened her eyes to see the face of the dog. Grom, she whispered. I heard you barking. Jacob, who entered the room at that moment, was stunned. The hospital staff, the nurses, and the guards who had rushed in to chase the dog, one by one they crashed into Jacob's wide back. Maud was quickly on the mend, and Grom was gaining weight at the same rate and eating for three. Sandra was exhausted from making the dog porridge with huge pots. Christopher was finally able to sleep without dreams or fears. Jacob cared for his patient like an attending physician and a reverent lover. He gave the girl flowers and tried to spoil her with the delicacies he had prepared himself. After tasting a spoonful of salad, Maud appreciated the young doctor's culinary talents. Hmm. Have you ever dreamed of having your own restaurant? The girl asked. No. Maud smiled. You should try it. I'd work for you. I'm a good cook. As good as you are. She ate another spoonful of salad and then added, Maybe even better. 
Jacob, of course, did not open the restaurant, but he did the more important thing. He offered Maud his hand and heart, and the girl happily agreed. <laughs>